So Are you sure you know? I, you can vote. Can vote. All right, welcome everybody. It is two o'clock. Time for the colloquium. Um, today we have Maria Kasachenko. She is uh, a uh, assistant professor at CU and NSO here in Boulder. Uh, so a local, which is always good for us. Um, just started, yeah, la uh, late last year. Uh, Maria got a uh, degree in mathematics from uh, St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg State University in Russia and then a PhD from uh, Montana State University and after that she was a uh, postdoctoral fellow, a Shine postdoctoral fellow I should say at Berkeley um, and now she's here and she's going to talk to us about obviously data-driven models of uh, the solar corona uh, magnetic fields. Please. Thank you very much Alfred, for introducing me and I also to thank um, everybody oh, here. Jesus. Uh, I used Yes, yes. Yeah, do my one? Right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Is it on? Sure. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so good morning, every. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to thank Alfred for introducing me, and I would like to thank uh, uh, ATO for giving me this opportunity to talk. Today I'm going to talk about data-driven models of the solar corona magnetic fields. It will be um, more like a review uh, presentation of the recent progress that has been made in the direction of uh, data-driven models of the solar corona magnetic fields. Uh, specifically, the focus of my talk will be how do we use HMI observations because that's the main reason why these data-driven models started being popular. How do we use HMI observations to derive boundary conditions for these kind of models? And uh, I'll be presenting work that's not just mine. It is a work that has been performed during last four to five years by the Coronal Global Evolutionary Model team. Okay, so let's start. Here is the outline of my talk. First, I'm going to tell you about the types of model there are for finding coronal magnetic fields. Not an easy task. Uh, then I will uh, briefly review what ha have been the first uh, attempts to find uh, the coronal magnetic fields using data-driven models. Actually, it happened over I don't know, 30 years ago, gosh. And then I'll tell you about the electric field inversion methods that are necessary to derive the boundary conditions for these models. And we'll talk a little bit about what uncertainties there are in these types of inversions, what uncertainties there are in the observations that are used in these inversions, and um, yeah, just to give an, you an idea of where are we in terms of the uncertainty field for the electric field inversions. And then I'll uh, give you an overview, an overview of what do current data-driven models use for boundary conditions. Do they really use everything they are or not? And, we'll, and finally, I'll tell you what did coronal global evolutionary model do? What have we learned? How did we attempt to solve some of the problems? And finally, the summary and the bright future we have ahead of us. Okay, so let's start. Finding coronal magnetic fields. It's not an easy task because we cannot observe it directly, so we have to use inversions for that. Yes? We can observe coronal oh, Sorry, I forgot where I am. <laughs> um, but go ahead. Yes, yes uh, we cannot observe them at the high enough spatial and temporal resolution that needed to understand uh, the current uh, accumulation. So people had to use models. Uh, there are two types of models, static models and dynamic models. Static where you don't have the temporal evolution. And today I'm only going to focus on the dynamic models, models that have t as a variable. Among these type of models, there are three, three, groups of, three subgroups of models, data-inspired, data-constrained, and data-driven models. Okay, data-inspired models, what's that about? Data-inspired models use simplified setups to mimic observed scenarios. So they are inspired by whatever there is in uh, the observations. And here is a nice movie that some of you may recognize, uh, where we have a... Oh, <gasps> the movie should be playing. We haven't... 
Oh yes, there is a movie of the small bipole inserted into pre-existing fields, emergence. Uh, then uh, it interacts with an overlying field and hooray, we have an eruption. Something that we frequently observe on the sun. We don't try to reproduce and use the actual magnetic field as a function of time, but these models are extremely good for understanding the scenarios that are frequently observed on the sun. Second group of models are data constrained models, an example showed here. These models satisfy observations at one instant in time. So they actually use observations. Here is an example of a very nice work uh, performed uh, last year by Meng Jin and the company where they insert Gibson and Law flux rope into pre-existing field in such a way that it mimics the orientation, the properties of the CME as it propagates out. Finally, the data-driven model. These are the only models that evolve in response to observed boundary conditions at the bottom. And here is an example of such a model performed by uh, Anthony Yates. Here, a set of bipoles is inserted on the surface of the sun, and these bipoles is not out of the blue. They actually mimic the location and fluxes of the magnetic fields that have been observed by Kitt Peak Observatory. And today in my talk, I'm only going to talk about data-driven models as a, as, that evolve as a function of time. And I'm only going to talk about active region scale models. So there are all, there's a large group of uh, uh, large scale models that I'm not going to talk about today. Perhaps the first data-driven models that appeared um, have been performed by Mikic and McClyman in 1994 and also McClyman in 1997. And in their evolutionary techniques of two active regions, what they used were Haleakala, Stokes, Vector, Polarimetric, vector, vector Magnetic Field observations as boundary conditions for their evolutionary model. For initial conditions, they used potential field. And for the boundary conditions, um, they, used, they applied the electric field, DVDT, in such a way that the currents that, uh, in such a way that this electric field drives the whole system from the electric current, current density in the model to the observed current density in the observation. So basically, they tuned it to the electric current density that is observed on the sun. And that could be derived from the horizontal vector magnetic field component. And here is an example of what they got, the potential field lines for one active region, still in the four digits, and then on the right, the force-free field that they got from their model. So you see there is some kind of twisty uh, field, field structure forming above the photosphere. So that was the first attempt to do that. They had some problems with, uh, with uh, reproducing the shear component close to polarity inversion line, but that was the first data-driven model. Now, now we're in a far better position than having a couple of vector magnetic field measurements a day. Now we could measure the vector magnetic fields every 12 minutes and at the resolution of 360 kilometers. Here is nice, not animation, but observations of the vector magnetic fields as observed by Solar Dynamics Observatory. The red color shows us uh, the positive magnetic field, the blue, the negative magnetic field, and the arrows show us orientation of the vector. So you see there is all kind of dynamics and you could actually track it as a function of time. So because of that, because we have this nice observations, recently data-driven models became very popular. And if you look at the years of people who have been publishing in this area, you see that they start shortly after the SDO have been, has been launched. So there are two groups of models that, are, that I isolated, uh, magnetofrictional or MHD light models and full MHD models, two groups of data-driven models. Uh, the magnetofrictional model evolves the coronal field using induction equation. Um, here is the induction equation, dA dt is equal to V cross B minus mu J, where A is the vector potential, 
j is the current density. And now here is the trick, the main idea of the magnetofrictional model. Instead of solving full set of MHD equation for the velocity, what magnetofrictional model does, it just says the velocity is proportional to the Lorentz force. That's all it does. And uh, what makes this whole model data-driven is that for the electric field at the boundary, instead of using some out of the blue numbers or ad hoc electric fields, it actually uses, it might use the electric field derived at the photosphere. Okay, so here are all the idea, ideas, how do we find this electric field? In the full MHD set uh, approach, we have to solve a full set of MHD equations. And again, the data-driven component here, as of now, is how do we constrain this electric field at the boundary. And here I tried to cite everybody who is working in this direction. Uh, in the magnetofrictional, there are lots of people, Mark, Mark Chung, and then some European groups. Yeah, lots of work has been done, nice work has been done here recently. In the full MHD, there are also lots of nice attempts. And later I will actually show you what these models do actually use for the boundary conditions. So why do we, why there are two groups of models? <coughs> uh, the main reason why uh, magnetofrictional models are popular is that they are computationally inexpensive because they don't solve the full set of MHD equations. The problem with them is that they work very well for slowly evolving events. However, they don't work well if you are dealing with fast dynamics, like for example, what? like for example flares that we are very much interested in. Full MHD, they're very computation expensive, so you cannot really perform them for longer periods of time unless you use some tricks. However, they work much better for flares. So now the whole question is, we know how to simulate, well, we think we know how to, how to simulate uh, the solar atmosphere with these equations. How do we find the boundary conditions? And here where, where the whole question of finding photospheric electric fields come into play. And that's actually the primary area of my expertise. One approach for finding electric fields is try to get it from horizontal velocity V and magnetic field B as E minus V cross B then the whole problem basically boils down to another problem. How do we get the velocity? Historically, um, and the first attempts to find the velocity were using the local correlation tracking and then inductive methods. One of the most popular approach in this group is the day 4 vm method, differential affine velocity estimator for vector magnetograms. And it has been uh, developed uh, by Pete Chuck in 2008. Here, uh, an important thing to remember is that this method used the full vector magnetic field. It doesn't use any extra information like Doppler velocity fields. And it basically tries to solve uh, the vertical component of the induction equation. So BZ is known here. BZ, BH, BH is also known. So it basically finds VZ and VH. And then once these three variables are known, it finds the electric field. Okay, so here, this is one approach from horizontal velocity, V and B. Another approach to find photospheric electric fields is try to invert, to invert the Faraday's law. And then maybe use some tricks like, uh, like V cross B. But the main idea is here is can we really uncurl the Faraday's law here? So DBDT is observed. Can we get electric field uncurling this source term? There are several established methods to solve this problem. That method that has been developed at UC Berkeley and uh, later I joined the team of George Fisher and Brian Welsh is called the PDFI method or PTD Doppler FLCT ideal. So the first letter, letters of um, these four words. So this PDFI method, main idea is that it represents the electric field as a sum of poloidal and toroidal components. And I'm not showing it here just to make the understanding easier. And um, once you do it, you have to represent the electric field as a sum of inductive 
blue and non-inductive electric field red. To find the inductive component, what PDFI does, it uses the source term from the vector magnetic field observations, BX, BY, and BZ. And to find the non-inductive component, it has to use some extra information like horizontal velocities and vertical velocities from Doppler imaging. So it uses full B and Doppler velocity as input to get the three components of the electric field. Another method developed by Mark Chang et al. Uh, assumes that assumes different forms of this non-inductive potential, like for example, it assumes that it's equal to zero, or it assumes some kind, some form of electric current emergence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But these are more ad hoc approaches. They are not really trying to use, for example, the measurements of the vector of the Doppler velocity. Finally, there are several other approaches that have been uh, suggested more recently by Anthony Yates and European groups that I'm not going to talk today about. Of course, if you introduce any method before using it with the actual sun, you have to test it. And both PDFI and Day4VM methods from the two groups of approaches have been validated using simulations um, performed by B-Lab at the NMHD simulations. So these simulations, they basically represent a small sunspot emerging through a convecting zone. Uh, so here you see white positive, uh, uh, positive uh, magnetic field, uh, the black is negative, so it's a small, slowly emerging uh, magnetic field. And the advantage of this uh, kind of approach is that you know the, ve uh, the velocity field, you know the magnetic field, you pretend you don't know them, and then you compare the answers. Okay, and here are the results from the PDFI uh, electric field inversions. The top three, the po top row shows the three components of the electric field EX, EY, EZ, as they are in the NMHD test simulation. The middle row shows the three components from the reconstruction, and the bottom row shows the scatter plots between the two. The ideal uh, reconstruction should be a straight line. You see a bit of scattering, but solar, for solar physics, it's actually quite good for this particular test. Now, if the same test is performed, uh, this test has been performed and has been used by lots of uh, inversion technique in methods. And here is a comparison of validation for Dave, another method, day 4 vm and PDFI, all of these methods to see how well they reproduce the pointing flux and the helicity flux. And here are the slope, correlation coefficient, and fraction of the plots that I show here. So the ideal reconstruction should have ones uh, everywhere. And uh, basically, without going into numbers, the take home message here is that for the pointing flux, PDFI performs better <coughs> or similar to day 4 VM and Dave plus VZ accordingly, so the VZ is really crucial. And then for helicity flux, PDFI performs similar to and better than day 4 vm and day 4 vz So basically these, uh, these two methods, day 4 vm and PDFI, are the one that currently perform better uh, than anything else. So here are the results of the actual method uncertainties. How well do the method perform if there are no problems with the observations? However, as we know, there is noise in the observation, there is cadence, spatial resolution. How about these? So in the next several slides, I'm going to show you what aspects in the electric field inversions and the HMI observations affect the total magnetic energy that you get from these electric fields. You know, that one of the nice things about the electric fields, besides just the fact that you get the electric field, is that you could get the vertical pointing flux from the electric field. E cross B gives you SZ. If you assume that you're just pumping in the energy into closed volume, then as a function of time, you get the total amount of energy inside your closed small solar box. So in the next several slides, I'm going to show you how does a mission of the non-inductive component that I showed you recently, how does a mission of this non-inductive component affect the energy flux? How important is Is it important or we could just forget about it? How does um, uh, the Doppler velocity inversion affect this energy flux? What about the noise in the magnetic field? Can we really trust 
the magnetic field observations from the SDO. And finally, how does the cadence of the HMI affect this energy flux? All these aspects will be presented using the active region 10158, the favorite active region of all the solar physicists, at least the way the appearance of the HMI. Okay, so here is the first plot. I, I will show, uh, here I'm showing you the non-inductive electric field and the energy flux. Uh, different colors here uh, show the, this one shows the full electric field from all the components, inductive, non-inductive, everything. The electric field with all the flavors. And then the blue one shows only the, the P component, the, only the inductive component. So you throw away the Doppler velocity and everything else. At the time where, when the flare happened, and that's from the very beginning of the emergence to the flare time, you actually get quite a significant difference between the two, 30% difference in energy flux. So it is quite significant. So you, can, you, you really, if you can, you, you have to take the inductive component, non-inductive component into account. And one thing I, I should mention here is that that's the work that has been performed by a very smart a student in uh, Helsinki, Eric Kolumme, that uh, has been visiting Berkeley several times when I was there. How about, uh, uh, and that's the uh, results of the similar kind of test, uh, the non-inductive electric field effect on the energy flux using the NMHD simulations. Here is the uh, result when we only use the, non uh, the inductive component, so you have not very not perfect agreement between the two. Uh, this is when you include the horizontal velocity, the Doppler velocity, and then all of the above. So again, without non-inductive components, we miss, for this particular simulation, about 30% of the energy flux. The second aspect I want to tell you about is the Doppler velocity. How does the Doppler velocity inversion, we know that there are several types of and ways to, in, uh, to get the Doppler velocity. How does this Doppler velocity affect the energy flux? And here is a comparison of uh, two types of inversions of the Doppler velocity that yield slightly different result. So we get for this particular active region about 10% difference. Now what about the HMI noise and the energy flux? We know that HMI is prone to, uh, to the orbital motion. And uh, here is the estimate of the HMI noise levels in uh, Bx, By, and Bz as a function of time. So here is a standard deviation of uh, these three components of the magnetic field as a function of time. And you see for the Bh, you have about 80 Gauss uh, noise levels. And then for the Bz, it's about 20 Gauss something that's very known in the field. So if we apply this kind of uh, noise pattern on our original magnetic fields, if we pertur perturb these magnetic fields, we could get the perturbed electric fields and compare them with the original ones. And here is the difference that you get. Um, it's still not too bad, but there is uh, about 14% difference in the pointing flux that you get due to this effect. Okay. Now recently, um, HMI on board SDO has released high cadence vector magnetic fields uh, that are derived every 135 seconds. So we decided to look at the, at the electric fields derived from this data to see how the noise, how the time cadence affects the energy flux. And here is the result. We're basically comparing the blue curve with the red curve. And as you see, for the same spatial resolution, you don't find much difference. So you have um, higher cadence, but the spatial resolution is the same. So the question is, is it really the case that uh, the cadence of 12 minutes is good enough? Or we really need to look at the smaller spatial resolution to see uh, the spatial changes on, chart, on such short uh, on temporal scales? But for now, the answer is there is almost no difference in the energy flux. How about the helicity flux? I haven't talked about it today, 
But Helistiflux is in fact much more sensitive to any uncertainties at the boundary. Um, here we are comparing the same things as in the plot uh, before, different time cadences, and we see that for the helicity flux, uh, the difference is uh, a bit larger. Okay. Uh, Eric Kaluma has also looked at um, the HMI cadence and the day 4 VM energy flux which is a different method of deriving the electric fields. And in this case, um, what has been done is the velocity derived from Dave has been used to find the electric field, and then in the same way, uh, it has been used the electric field to find the cumulative energy. And uh, different cadences have been used here. And what has been found for this case is using Dave for VM, you actually get quite a large difference between two cadences, that it seems that it has to do something to do with the fact that um, the code gets less inductive at the shorter time scales. Something to keep in mind. Okay. So there is a 50% 50 50 difference in the energy flux. OK, so to summarize uh, what I have showed, what aspects in the electric field inversion and the HMI observations affect the energy fluxes? All of these, the take-home message here, the non-inductive electric field components are really important. So you miss about 30% of energy, at least for this particular active region, if you don't take the non-inductive components into account. And then the HMI input data, meaning the magnetic field and the velocity, have to be and should be, especially the Doppler velocity, very carefully calibrated. Okay. So now going back to the data driving. What observed data do current data-driven models use? Here are again the two groups of models that I mentioned before, magnetic frictional and a full MHD. Currently, most of the models are still using the Z component, the vertical component of the magnetic field, or the line of sight component. Here are some nice works in this group. Only recently, there have been attempts to do data driving using full uh, uh, or a full vector magnetic fields at the photosphere. And these are Mark Chang and Keiji Hayashi and then um, the Chinese group. And then finally, uh, in this group of models that include the non-inductive Doppler velocity field from VZ, very few uh, work has been done, but it's a work in progress, so we're getting there. What I want to show you in the rest of the talk is the work that has been performed uh, uh, by a CGEM effort, Coronal Global Evolutionary Model Team. There are still lots of problems, but um, we're trying to address them. So a little bit about CGEM. Um, CGEM, or Coronal Global Evolutionary Model, tries to drive the coronal evolution using both the magnetic field and electric field derived from it. So on the inputs, we have the sun, vector magnetic fields, the line of sight Doppler velocity, we get the horizontal velocity from the magnetic fields, then we use it all to get the electric field, and then the derived electric fields are then used by Lockheed Martin, Mark Chung, to drive the magnetofrictional model in the corona, and then these um, magnetic field configuration right before the flare is used as in input, as initial conditions for MHD model of an active region by Berkeley Group. Um, this is a large effort. Um, as you see, there are three institutions, UC Berkeley, Lockheed Martin, and Stanford University. Uh, the PI is George Fisher. He's responsible for the project direction. Um, then we are also responsible for electric field inversions and the MHD component. Then the Lockheed Martin is responsible for development and validation of um, magnetic frictional model and also for the global model, the flux transport model. That's uh, Mark De Rosa. And then at Stanford University, um, they're responsible for vector magnetic field and Doppler data reduction, a very important step. And also for Keiji Hayashi is, uh, is responsible for heliosphere simulations. But today I'm only going again to talk about the active region scale. So here is the 
uh, vector magnetic fields that we used as inputs for the first CGM run. Here we have Bx, By, and Bz component of the magnetic field, and then the Doppler velocity of the same area. And the reason why this active region 11158 has been selected is because it start, we, it, we could observe it from the very emergence, meaning that we didn't really have to take many assumptions about the initial configuration of the magnetic field and simulate from the birth of the patient all the way to the, to the flaring phase. So here is, the, for the context, the same uh, vector, uh, the same vertical component of the magnetic field, and on the right, the horizontal electrograms, the electric field uh, shown with arrows, and then the vertical electric field shown in color uh, in this center of this active region. So you're looking at, on the left, at the magnetogram, on the right, on the electrogram. Here is a movie of what's going on. In the beginning, you see that as the active region is emerging, it looks very noisy, not surprising, because we use DBT as a source term. But as uh, the active region keeps evolving and becomes more persistent, you see a uh, formation of a persistent structure. <coughs> Let me play this movie one more time. Let's see. If you try to understand the structure of the electric field, then you see um, the existence of strong electric fields at the polarity inversion line and at the solar penumbra. There is lots of structure. And then you see a small glitch caused by, um, by the change of the horizontal magnetic fields right during the flare. Here is a single snapshot uh, right after the flare. OK, and then after we found these electric fields, we used them as boundary conditions for a magnetofrictional model developed by uh, Mark Chang and Lockheed Martin. And what you're seeing here on the left, you're looking at the top view on the sun, and these are the side views, and these are all synthetic images. So what you're looking at here are the coron is the coronal brightness, um, or synthetic coronal brightness which is basically a, logarithmically, uh, a logarithm of the line of sign integrated field line averaged j squared. So you're integrating along the view, the, current, the, the square of the current. And you could uh, very well see the formation of the loop-like structures as seen from above and from the sides. You see it's all very slowly evolving because it's magnetofrictional. But uh, the hope here is that um, these uh, fields would tell you about the magnetic field structure in the atmosphere. Here what happens if we compare uh, the magnetofrictional model. Um, actually, that's a, this is not the magnetofrictional model. OK, once we use the magnetofrictional model as initial conditions, for the MHD right before the eruption, um, we could actually model through the flare as it goes on. As I said, the mean frictional model cannot be used uh, during the flare because it's a very slow, quasi-static um, type of evolution. However, with the MHD, which is the full MHD code, we could go through the flare. And here are some preliminary results on the right. You see the random, uh, random HD synthetic emission, so the same type of emission that you've seen before. And on the left, you see the AIA-131 image. So you see that there are some differences, there are some similarities, but overall, it's not too bad. And on the, bad, on the, uh, on the bottom row, you see a comparison, again, of the right image coronal fields right in the middle of the low-lying low coronal fields, and on the left, the IBIS observations, um, ground observations of this part. Again, some, some similarities and some differences. So we're getting there. So to summarize, the HMI vector magnetic field measurements for the first time made it possible to run data-driven models of the coronal magnetic field. Currently, there are predominantly two groups of active region scale data-driven models, 
magnetic frictional and full MHD. And one thing I haven't talked, uh, haven't mentioned, is that here in HEO, especially in this group, there is lots of work being done and lots of collaboration and progress being done to do data-driven full MHD simulations. The models that the current data-driven models they use HMI observations to get boundary conditions, the vector magnetic fields and the electric fields from the inversions. Uh, there are different methods to find the electric field and one should be very careful when choosing one because uh, you get different energies and hence different evolution. Driving the, your code with just using the line of sight magnetic field and emission of the Doppler velocity could really affect your energy budget. And recently we attempted to address some of the issues of the data driving in the coronal global evolutionary model. So that's what it is now. Now where are we going from here into future? There are some directions of improvements listed here. One of the things that needs to be done, currently we have only tested the electric fields using one MHD code one MHD simulation, which is, of course, not enough. Further validation and improvement of existing electric field inversion using perhaps more realistic MHD simulations is crucial to be sure we're doing well. And we're currently collaborating with the group here, with Matthias Rempel in particular, and Yu Hong Fang, to improve our inversions. Currently, all data-driven, they use the horizontal electric field from the observation. These electric fields, when you use them from the inversions, they only constrain the vertical component of the magnetic field. What is needed here is transition from basically one to three component, the full B driving. Finally, if we think a little bit about the future, DKIST will start operating hopefully in a year. First test will be performed this summer. And DKIST will measure the magnetic fields in the chromosphere and the photosphere. So the question is, how can we really improve, uh, um, improve our models and how can we constrain the driving electric fields using magnetic fields at two, high, at two heights? Is it possible? And then with DKIST, we will also have uh, magnetic field measurements higher above the photosphere. So in principle, we could try to validate whatever we get from the, the data-driven models to see how well we are doing. Here is just a snapshot, or it's a movie, let's see. Ah, no, it's a snapshot. So here is a snapshot of the magnetic field derived from, <laughs> magnetic field derived from um, um, the CGM model, the magnetic frictional model at two heights, and then at two cuts. And DKIS2, as I said, will observe the magnetic field in the photosphere, chromosphere, and also in the limb. So we could, in principle, perform data-driven simulations using the HMI, SDO, and then we could compare the field structure, the one we get from the data-driven simulations and DKIST observations, as the active region crosses the field to have, finally, the um, good test of the structure we get. Finally, I wanted to advertise the past <laughs> data-driven workshop that has been held and organized by Yu Hong Fang and Matthias Rempel here in Boulder. And we had a very nice group of people. It was a very exciting workshop with lots of discussions. And hopefully this workshop will happen again in two years. So data driving is a really a quick developing field. And if you're interested in it, it's a good time to jump on it. Thank you. There is ample time for questions. Sarah. So, um, so you, you're, you're driving it at the lower boundary. How do you think you might be able to use observations of the coronal magnetic field um, to validate or constrain or otherwise be assimilated into, your, um, into this kind of approach? Or do you think it's something that is completely controlled by the lower boundary? Yeah, that's a very good question. You're, you're thinking like, can we really insert some kind of realistically, okay, some kind of uh, observed uh, flux rope structure into pre-existing model? Not necessarily. Model. I mean, I'm more sort of thinking, um, you know, to the extent that there's uncertainty in your model, you right. might be able to do some sort of ensemble modeling and down-select right. in response to what you would observe 
with uh, coronal observations. But if you had, and it doesn't even have to be coronal magnetic field, if you have additional observations in the corona, like you showed your example of your flare, and you know you could see you were similar, but you were different in other ways, right. I think there's a way to somehow assimilate the information in the corona to improve that match. Very good question. Currently, there has been nothing done in this direction, but data and simulation, that's the whole reason why there was a data and simulation workshop as part of this data-driven workshop. We're not really there, yes, but in principle, yeah, how would we really do that, yeah. Yeah, I was hoping you were going to tell me, but... <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I mean, uh, yeah. No, I, I think I agree with you. I, I think it's a very it good question. It was super important, I don't think there's yes, a clear yes, answer, yes, so. but uh, yeah. yeah, that's a very good, very good point. Hopefully, in future, we'll be able to. Mm. Yeah, right now, it's just a simple um, boundary condition kind of problem, yeah, where everything is at the bottom boundary, yeah. <coughs> good point. In those, uh, can you go back to the energy evolution? Yes. Energy flux? Right. Um, previously, the energy evolution. The, yeah. You know, that, that flare occurs. Right. So this, is the, the, the energy is just how much flux is being put into the... Right. It's just the uh, integral is a function of time shown so above. it's not actually the magnetic field evo energy evolution in the corona. So you no, it's not the corona, it's just the flux, right. Okay. It's a so you don't see actually a decrease in the... So, okay, you don't see a decrease in the flare at the... Uh, so the driving is pretty much continuous, there's not much of... Uh, right, right, yeah, yeah, the flare time you, you don't you see, don't see much. change in the photosphere driving or any re back reaction due to the... The back flare. reaction you could actually see it very well, yes, there is a clear back reaction. I haven't shown it here, but there is actually a very interesting enhancement close to the polarity inversion line that is caused by, by the change in the horizontal field. So there is a sudden influx of the pointing flux. Yeah, 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 you, you, you really well see. But here, if you look at the cumulative plot, you don't really see it. But I, I'll show you in the paper we have it, yeah. Okay. But the, the flux rate, you do see a change. Yes, okay. yeah, you do see. Yeah, yeah, you see it. Mm -hmm. It's just not visible here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yes. Yeah, the difference here between the inductive and the full electric field, <coughs> you see in this um, example, when you do this for another active region or so, is the difference the same or is it also depends oh, a little bit on the conditions yes, of a particular active region? Yes, it really depends on the particular condition on the active region. Here also the inductive, uh, the non, the full electric field it includes the Doppler velocity, which basically tells you about the amount, the emergence cancellation properties. If you don't have much. Uh, much going on in terms of the change of the overall flux, then you might not have such a big difference. But it hasn't been done yet. We did it for a couple active regions only. What has to be done is more, yeah, more calculations to really see what's going on. And also more coronal observations to see maybe for, uh, for the coronal simulation, it, this difference wouldn't be so large. So we really haven't really explored this thing yet. Just another question yes. mm -hmm. about the radon MHD simulation. Which one? The, the radon, red, sorry, red, red, red MHD, red MHD. Yeah. The, uh, you know, bills. Right. So that, pre I mean, is that, yeah, the, the MHD one. Right. So he put in the initial state. Right. And he sees this, is this full MHD in the sense that. Here he used the zero beta. Zero beta. Yeah, here he used the zero beta. Just the right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's the very beginning. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. You didn't talk any about the data-driven global scale simulations. Right. But I wonder if you just, in general terms, uh, say what you think is the value of those sort of simulations compared to the active region scale. Like, what new information do they bring? Very good question. Uh, currently, what has been done is uh, we observe the active region scale uh, magnetic field. We find electric fields from these. Then for the global scale, what's used are the, is the flux transport model that basically slowly evolves the, the 
the magnetic field, the Z component of the magnetic field. Now the question is how how well uh, do these uh, simplified evolution models represent the actual uh, observations of the of the magnetic field and the electric field? Again, they don't use the non-inductive uh, component of the electric field, so for now these are quite simplified. So the active region scale would be much more realistic. The reason I ask is because there's a lot of interest in the stellar community, uh, right. because you can use those global scale simulations with other stars observations right. to actually predict the space weather in exoplanets. Right. Space. Yeah. Uh, in Berkeley Group, uh, uh, together Ben Lynch, he is now he has not uh, he hasn't published yet. Uh, ben Lynch, he he has been using the the magnetic magnet magnetograms from this. Um, from from the distant star, but so what uh, what he has been doing, he's just using the simplified shear. So we still have a lot to uh, we ha we still have a, a lot to <laughs> learn from. Um, no, well, to add to that, the the um, the global. Well, if you if you care about coronal holes, both as objects or as the sources of the solar wind. The, this, the global models that use this kind of approaches have much better match between observations of, of, of the coronal holes than the, norm, the simple potential field extrapolations of the corona. And so a huge part of the, I mean, the, the, the effort there is to understand global structures, filaments, uh, coronal holes, Things that will be impossible in a small box like this. Yeah, and uh, thank you for your comment, Andres. Uh, Andres, he is. Uh, if I correct me if I'm wrong, you are talking about uh, the way how people now very well understand, for example, the filament eruption kind of global evolution. What still hasn't been done is a global model of data-driven model of the driving at the active region scale. Yes, please. Yeah, and I was going to just follow up on that because I think you've just made the point which I was going to make, which is from the point of view of the large scale filaments which form the quiescent filaments, not the ones, not the active region um, activity. The global models are probably better than anything you can do at the moment right. with any sort of data driven, uh, like she's talking about, because the time scales are much longer and it's really the flux transport and diffusive processes that are accumulating the twist and the helicity that then build up like the polar crown filaments. And if you're looking at stellar systems, that's going to be a very significant thing. So at the moment, it seems that they're very complementary approaches because right. one is on the flux emergence time scales of active regions, the other is on the flux transport time right. scale. Mm -hmm. um, and but both of them are actually significant for space weather and so for stellar models. But it, it would capture one side of it anyway. Right. And on the global scale, yeah, there has been lots of nice work performed by Anthony Yates, and he's getting Harvey Prize this year for this work. Other questions? If there are no other questions, then let's thank Maria again. Thank you. Thank you.